Um, I wanted to start off actually, Cassidy, by asking you a little bit how you got into model making and, you know, and you know, how you, in a sense, actually how you found yourself in Field and Craig, Clegg, you know, where you, where you studied. I think that I didn't realise there was such thing as a model making course, but it'd be really yeah, interesting no, to hear more often, about that. I think people are often amazed when they find out that you can do a full, full three year BA in model making. And, um, it's a fantastic course. The one I did was down in Bournemouth at the, at the Arts University down there. Um, and it's not just architecture, I should point out. It's, it's broadly separated into three different disciplines. So you've got architecture, product design, and work for film and television. Um, but a lot of the skills are transferable between the three. So whether that is doing things like machining, whether that's um, digital manufacturing, so 3D printing, laser cutting, or whether it's um, processes like moulding and casting, for example, they, they tend to work in all of those different industries. Um, so that's where I did my training and learned a really good broad skill set. And then after that, after I graduated, went and worked in London as a freelancer doing architectural models. Um, and then decided to leave the southeast, come come back to the southwest, which is where I'm from originally. And there were a number of freelancing opportunities in the area. So continued doing a lot of architectural work. Um, started doing a lot of set design work as well, which was something I was fairly unfamiliar with. But again, you can, you can sort of easily understand how the same skills uh, transfer between those two. Um, did a lot of mould making and casting with a, a more of an artist, I suppose you'd describe him as a guy called Timothy Richards, who's based in Bath. And then whilst doing freelancing, we did a lot of work that Field and Clegg were actually outsourcing at the time. So even though I wasn't working for the practice directly, it was sort of inadvertently through those outsourced projects. And then in January 2018, I think the opportunity came up to come and become a full-time member at FCB. And I mean, I've always um, been a huge fan of work of the practice and especially also the models that they've made. I think some of the, the former model maker Ken's work has been quite well documented in various publications over the years. And I was always a huge fan of that sort of style and approach to model making. So uh, yeah, it was a, a, a no-brainer really when the opportunity came up. Having, having been both um, in-house and also, I guess, externally, how did you, um, how do you think the culture of the model making shop is different in where you, you know, how would you describe the different cultures, model making shop cultures you've seen? Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, very, very different, actually. Um, the kind of model making training and external model makers are really focused on very high end models in terms of their sort of quality of finish. So you'd be much more used to receiving fully finished technical drawings. And then from those, you would spend a considerable amount of time making a one-off piece. Whereas obviously in practice, it's the complete opposite. We use models very much as a design tool. So we're using it right from stage, or the early stages of project, all the way through. Um, I think that's probably the biggest difference that you find. Um, it was also, it was lovely. I think um, every architect's office I've ever been into, I think the architects are always so proud of the of the model making quite often you know they take you through and it's kind of like it's where the the pulsing heart is quite often of a practice um you know i remember renzo taking me down to his you know, go down the bottom and actually his eyes really really lit up as soon as you got that sort of physicality of being connected to it and i was it was lovely seeing the film and actually seeing a couple of your different spaces in there but i was wondering where are they located within in terms of how the practice is laid out because you've got them in both bath and london i think yeah, so we how do. does it sort of um, they're, they're essentially right in the in the centre, certainly in Bath. Um, you come down the stairs and we have a kind of glass wall frontage. So it means that people well it not only means that you can view in and see what's going on all the time, but it makes sure that it doesn't seem as um, too intimidating a place to approach. So we're always trying to make sure that people feel welcome and um, invite them in. And yeah, it's, it's certainly central to the whole design process. So by having it in the middle of the studio um, means that everybody can come in all the time. So how big is your team? Oh, sorry. sorry, I was just going to chip in because in a way there's two types of models really. There are 
there are the presentation ones that we put out on display, but there are also the, the models that we, uh, the development models, which we kind of cling on to and make sure we're you know, sitting in the workspace and is there as a, as a constant reference. If you can try to come out of a meeting with a client still with the model and bring it back to the workplace, and, and, and those are the important ones as well, sort of in amongst where we work, and, and so we're reminded of what we're trying to achieve. And how, so how many staff um, are in the model making workshop? Um, in Bath there's two and in London mm -hmm. there's only one. But what we really, you know, what's fundamental is that we are essentially there to facilitate model making for all staff. So even though we're there to make, quite often we'll be working on things like presentation models and exhibition models. It's to make sure that all the tools, all the equipment, uh, materials are ready and available and the expertise is there as well so that certainly with um, architectural students who may not have loads of experience these days in model making uh, can come in, ask questions, get everything they need in a sort of central hub and work from that and feed that back out into the studio. Mm. That's a that's a really nice model actually, it's quite, it is, sounds as though because yeah. some different practices I think work in different ways and some of them actually the model making culture it's a sort of it's a zone of its own and it's kind of got a whole different culture and it does though actually there's a really fluid line between your expertise and the architects which is kind of I, I think that does probably define it from places I've visited as being quite different and I actually um Hugo going back to that I think the kind of interesting thought of talking about that the way in which the models have a really um, integral part of the process um, and so how does it work like how how quickly is you know running us through how your own process works very often with a project how often how soon do you get into the model making workshop is it discussed you know when do you discuss it with Cassidy or his team and how much just how does that kind of come about well it's funny it I mean it will completely vary from from project to project um, because we might model anything from a, uh, a, con a conceptual abstract or figurative piece all the way through to a detailed assembly or a one-to-one -one. And, and I suppose it, um, it, it, it depends where it fits and is really worthwhile because obviously um, over the last 25 years um, the, the digital modeling has gone a long way to replacing physical modeling which which used to be the sort of um, the only way other than a perspective or an isometric of fixed drawing to be able to experience um, something. So, so there is that prevalence of, or there is that um, growing reliance on, on digital modeling, modeling. Then we have the sort of the necessary models or um, that we will always do, you know, towards a bid um, submission or, a, or to help fundraising or for a planning, planning commission. And then it becomes after that, it's about will really what, what's, um, um, where you're going to trust in putting the computer away for a little bit and spend some time physically modeling um, form. Um, uh, and so um, I'm, I'm sort of thinking back to um, sort of early conceptual pieces in the practice, um, for example, a, a, an art gallery and, and we did uh, a, um, a, a cast ceramic piece and a piece that um, uh, expressed um, floating courtyards in the sky and so forth. And there, that's been a, popular one on the South Bank, we did some concrete maquettes. Um, but, um, but then the ones I quite like are the actual sort of the, the architectural models in the middle of the process that you might use, um, you might take along on a regular basis to a meeting with a client. So you always make them slightly, you know, the right size for a train so they'd sort of move around with you a little bit. Uh, and those are the ones which um, uh, would probably, uh, what I like about that is, is um, you can decide how you're going to make the model and decide what you want to show and what you can't yet show. It's, an, it's a sort of really forgiving way of, of, of having gaps in the design, you know, much, much more forgiving than a 3D model on a, on a screen. Um, and so the most successful models have been those that, um, that uh, leave those gaps for your kind of imagination to fill later and to help the conversation with the clients to talk about the things you've really got to talk about now. Um, and um, and it, it, really, it really works. It works because um, all of us, I think, can engage much more readily with physical objects. We talk to them with children. And we use scale models like dolls' houses and train sets and stuff. We understand scale 
you know, um, a, a lot more everyone does. So when we're talking with librarians or or with digital services or anybody in a, in a, in a client base um, to get around a model uh, and see see something emerge from that, it, it sort of unlocks, like I say in the film, it really unlocks the conversation um, with those people. But uh, but uh, the, the the shorter answer is it depends. It depends what works, and um, I, I particularly like when we get into the into detailed mock-ups of a particular soffit, car soffit Abbey with doing and something that's very hard to, it's an elliptical, it was an elliptical space that is virtually impossible to explain on a, on a screen with a flat image. And so to sort of mock up the, the cast lines and the form of that soffit is really interesting. Cassidy, can I ask you a little bit about, just thinking around the process, so I guess leaving aside presentation models be quite good to come to the, the sort of presentation side but um, how you you know what your engagement is with the architects do they just come in and you know how does how does the conversation start do you let them go free where does your expertise and the sort of dialogue um, take place yeah no we, we essentially operate very much a kind of open door policy so that um, you're not discouraged from engaging with the resource and it is a case of, uh, if, you, if you want to make a model or if you need to make a model you can literally come in you know and just the, the conversation just starts there and then um, and it can be something incredibly simple you know a really basic bone massing study right the way through to okay we want you know a big presentation model for example um, but I think it's you know they both have their uh, value, I suppose I would say. Presentation models have one value, but process models, design development pieces, uh, are invaluable in many ways, and they tend to get an incredible amount of use as well, like Hugo said, in terms of going backwards and forwards to meetings. They can rack up a lot of air miles models, especially <laughs> those, those types. Um, and I think, for me, in many ways, they, they, you could argue they are the most valuable because you get so much out of them. In terms of interacting you... with the, sorry. Yeah, no, keep going, that was it. I was just say, in terms of interacting with the, the design team, it's, um, we do, we have an open sort of plan office and mm. the kind of culture at FCB is that we do spend a lot of time together, you know, things like shared lunches, for example. So everybody tends to have a very good working relationship as well as personal relationship. Um, and I think that's really, really important because something I've come across a lot uh, over the years is a kind of workshop phobia that develops certainly with a lot of students where they quite often try to avoid the process of model making because they don't or they don't feel comfortable in the environment um, and we try to sort of democratize that and make sure that people are welcome and they understand that we're you know we're easy to engage and, and get the ball rolling when it comes on projects. Well, what's what's great about Cassidy's um, about the model shop in our bath office is it's right by the lunch queue and um, and it's got a big glass big glass window and it's all all glazed partition so you can see what's going on and and it tends to be the go-to spot for, uh, you know when you've got a coffee in the morning to go and have a look and see what's happening and it's it's a good place to to, to keep track of actually what we're all doing and and, and uh, and it's also winds up being a good place for impromptu kind of crits or reviews of the work, um, uh, which is quite nice. So it's great having a central space like that. I also think it'd be great if, if with PCs on our desk, it'd be great if there was more model making on desks as well um, going on. Um, but uh, I think we should work on that. We should work on that, Cassidy, as well. Yeah. And so, how, how many? How many of the models are being produced by the architects, Cassidy, and how many are you doing? Is there, is there a process where someone describes what they're trying to get to and sometimes hands it to you and sometimes does it themselves, or, or is it more one than the other? Um, I'd say, on the whole, it's probably about 80 20 in terms of the model makers doing the work and okay. stuff doing the work. But that said, it could, it could be 100% an architect does the work mm -hmm. and they're getting um, just the absolute basics that they need from us. So it's kind of, I want to make this model. Great, right, well, here's the space. Um, these are the materials we're looking at. We might have a conversation about what materials are most suitable. So, you know, there might be a temptation to jump straight in and start working with timber, for example. And actually, 
the best thing to do off, more often than not is to start with something like card and just get to grips with the concept and then develop that further and further. Um, sometimes obviously it's 100% the model maker as well, so we won't get any kind of physical interaction from the architectural side, but they will always need it. They will always um, essentially kind of oversee it to a certain degree and really accommodate and those changes that the design and development as it comes through. Yeah, so that's design development. I think it's like, I'm interested really in that early process stuff too. You know, how it's often a way of finding your way into a project. And I think there was, you also mentioned too, that there's there's been moments where sort of something where almost what the model you presented back has enabled the architect to see something different, or there might've been a different material used or a mistake or something kind of in it that actually the model unlock itself unlocks something in the process of you having done yeah, definitely. I think one of the classic things, and this kind of relates back to the the kind of conversation about physical models and digital models, is that was the number of times I've had architects come in, see the model that we've been working on, the project that they might be, you know, might spend months, if not years, working on, and they'll say, "I didn't expect it to look like that," and it just seems absolutely incredible that having spent that much time on a project. I think it's because you can get tunnel vision, you can get blindsided when you're just focusing on a screen. So I think that's, and it, yeah, it happens an awful lot. It's, uh, it's quite a revelation often for people. And, and obviously then that knocks back on, you know, that will be talked about. And if changes were sort of required, they might look at, okay, well, how's about you know, we change the messing here, et cetera, et cetera. So. I think that's really interesting that, that um, difference between looking and seeing. And I think often we see stuff on screen and our brains are trained to, to absorb an awful lot of information on screen, but also to, to, um, to um, discard a lot of information as well. So there's an element of uh, uh, reality, really, um, uh, um, sorry, seeing a model as opposed to looking at a screen, really seeing the information. And also um, taking time with it as well and controlling the viewpoint things that you get with a with them with a model um, a little bit like having a, a, a vase in your hands so and you don't see the whole vase ever but but you stick with the vase and roll it around and you've got your mind's eye now has the whole thing and it's an entirely different relationship um, with a with an architectural form um, being physically you know there in front of you which is why also you might like exactly that tunnel vision so it's a it's a good it's a good check and balance of, of the ideas as well i think it's a really nice thing hugo joe is that when you were identify and it sounds as though what you're also talking about was and i don't know the degree to which it is but a moment to move off the screen is also when a when you're resting with a certain aspect of a project and that mm -hmm. the model enables you to concentrate that's a deep concentration on something and I think it came out in what you were talking around of that idea of that the being able to distill a particular aspect of the project like even discarding okay we don't need to know the details of that bit but we need to really resolve one aspect of it and that the model is a way to carry you through that process but um, that's quite right yeah um and um and also not just just not just the being with a model and, and learning from it but actually the making and the craft and we all know that making and doing stuff with our hands frees up our minds and it's a really good relationship um, if i had a, a new year's sort of resolution it would be to to actually model throughout you know for everyone to be modeling to, to some extent in the firm, um, including me because i think it's a way of unlocking creativity that we um, should just absolutely you know grab hold of it's a great way to unlock creativity and it's a great way for sort of critical appraisal of, of, of of your work <coughs> i was interested in also the um you know i think as you spoke about it the kind of evolution of um technology around the model making environment and workshop i think you know you often staying on top of that is something and it was i was struck by i was thinking back to the um to that exhibition by herzog de Moore and of all of their in the tate where they just kind of filled it with the process models um and it was a they were talking i think around that they're that, that, that explosion of, of being able to form find was a result of the, um, the change in technology. It actually meant they were able to just produce hundreds of them and really to develop something up. And I was wondering if there were similar moments that actually either, either of you could sort of identify that 
the model making. There'd been something in that world that it had changed how you'd worked or been able to see or the work of the practice or even the kind of the nature of the architecture. Were there was anything in that that side of the making process which is it had accelerated or changed what was produced? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. You got one, Cassidy? So have a go. No, you go for it. You go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's the thing that, um, that there is, there is output, but there's, I think that the, the, the biggest change with technology, with laser cutting, 3D printing and so on, is to um, uh, capture simply more detail. And um, um, it's, it's, it's incredible. And everyone was pr pressing that. And, and so there's a model in the film of, uh, of, a, of a Victorian cotton mill, and um, you can, if you've got it on a drawing, you can you can model it quickly, and you can actually get loads of loads of detail in there without huge amounts of effort. And so, so you've sort of raised the raised um, the level of inquiry, if you like, into into the model making. And you also don't have to do super super sized models as well for, um, to to capture that level of detail in the whole. So there's something really interesting about that and um, being able to use um, less time less materials to show more and, um, and and not be worried about binning it if it's not working out and doing the next piece as well so um, yeah it's, maybe there's a level of detail thing I don't know if we we've, we've even well we haven't even begun to sort of really test the uses of 3d printing and those kinds of technologies and how the digital side of our information and the physical making come to you know come together um, I'm not sure if that completely answers answers the question but Plasti have you got yeah I think um definitely agree with what Hugo's saying there and I think um one one project recent project anyway that springs to mind I think it sort of touches on um, what Kate was asking was um being able to churn out lots of different iterations using the new technology. And I know mm -hmm. on the recent Portsmouth University project, which you'll certainly be familiar with, Hugo, um, the team were able to create or generate a range of different massing studies in a very short space of time um, and then use those in um, client sort of led conversations to discuss various aspects about the project and you know, through those really quick simple massing studies um, it worked towards the, something that's similar to the final design that we're, we're working on at the moment. So it does it, it does improve speed to a certain degree. I quite often um, find that when we're working and if the printer's wearing away in the background it's almost like having an extra person. So obviously you've got to do the input, you've got to prepare the files for printing but once you set up to that point, it might be that you, you hit play, um, you go home for the evening, and when you come back in the morning, you've got something just sat there, ready mm. to, to pick up and start having a look at. So in that way, it's, it's certainly made a huge difference. Um, and it's interesting, I think uh, the technology in model making obviously gets a lot of discussion about it, and I think it's probably it's probably pushing 10 years since I was doing my degree and there was a lot of discussion at the time about how or would 3D, 3D printing for example especially replace model making as we knew it at the time and I think you know the evidence kind of speaks for itself over the last 10 years that that simply hasn't happened at all and all that has happened is it's just become another tool so you know, traditionally you might have just had a bandsaw and a disc sander and then you got a laser cutter and then you got a 3D printer and then you got a desktop CNC mill for example and the best models or the most interesting models I think tend to come from a combination I think I touched that on video that when you're using all the different bits of technology and the variety of materials and those kind of come together it's often when you get some really interesting output. Okay, can I just add though, there's a sort of, there's two sides to the, the argument really, or discussion, because, um, and in fact, Casti said press play, which made me, made me think about it, which is the, 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 the more sophisticated the technology that we have access to, the more likely it is that there's sort of computer work done up in front of the model making work, that, it's in, that it becomes the outcome of, of computer time. And I think that we, all, you know, um, we ought to be keen to, to um, 
uh, use our hands um, and our brains at the same time, making um, probably more the sort of the, the risk models or the, the way there's serendipity or just pure experimentation you know like phone board and, and scalpels or or cardboard that there is a there is a it's important to not lose that part of the beginning of the process just to um uh i suppose um well just to see what you can do without going via a computer to get there you know the, the creative thing which takes me sort of back to the maybe the 90s when there was a prevalence for MDF. You, you, you talked about the white models, the era, you know, the, two, the 2000, but, but in the 90s it was all about MDF and you get your hands on a bit of copper and some brass strip or whatever. And the models were much more a sort of a, 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 an output of craft, which I think maybe comes into the buildings more as well. So, so there's an element of trying to make sure that we need to that we don't go via a computer always. Maybe we go via a sketch and then uh, then start working with the raw materials with our hands. I think that's really important. Mm. The, the element of craft seems to have stayed um, quite a lot um, the, um, within the... I'm thinking around often sort of the presentation models, and I think there's different types of presentation models. You know, they're, they're sometimes they're, they're the sort of models sometimes to convince a client seduce convince a client one or the other um and then there's the um uh, and then there's the you know the very finished models which kind of try and wrap it up but there's from what i've witnessed quite often with model makers is actually there's real crafting goes into thinking around this level of you know are you seducing or are you trying to get people to understand it and what your audience is and i kind of i wonder if both of you can just reflect a little bit about how you because like, they're very considered i mean what i've often find they're very considered they thought about almost like a design project you know what does this model want to be you know what level of detail do we keep into it for those forms of communication which are so vital for convincing people of a design and i kind of wondered if you, you could both talk about how you know how that interaction comes from an architect and then the expertise of somebody like cassidy who understands how to turn that idea into something in model form with certain materials yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's oh, actually you go, Hugo. You go, Hugo. You had something on that. I I, I think that the, the the delight the, the the delightful part of the of the discussion is is how where you position yourself between sort of fact and fiction, or where with with uh, as as you say the capturing the essence of a project which is somewhere between the real and the completely abstract. What are the things we want to, want, want to um, express? Uh, uh, and, and, and in a way, as a development model, that's then there for you to, to, to remind you and to, to follow. Um, but I can picture um, uh, um, us talking about um, Murray's Mills in Manchester, Cassidy, that model, working on, on that and how we're trying to capture within a, a model that's um, effectively of a brick a red brick scheme but we don't want to talk about red brick because it's all red brick and it doesn't help we want to talk about texture and tone and, and uh, grain and, and so forth so so we'll um uh we'll we'll just sit in the shop and talk it through and talk about what we're what we're trying to achieve it's quite hard and we should have that we should have a camera on that actually it's quite hard to to run back that conversation but um uh it's quite, it's quite iterative, and um, Cassidy and we say, well, um, you say what you're trying to describe, what you're trying to feel, and Cassidy will go away and just trying to work up some options, some sort of little mock-ups and some samples and so forth, try out different materials, try spraying stuff. And, uh, and it's really fun, actually, because it's quite fast, and, it, and it's, the, it's the best, one of the best bits about the project, because you're sort of designing the model, not just designing the building, and that's another project. Uh, and it's a quick project and, the, and the, it doesn't matter if it goes wrong so much unless it's a you know bid that's due in in about three days time but the, but, a, but it, uh, for a development model it shouldn't matter if it goes wrong so it's just it's trial and error and feeling really and conversation which again is a really good reason to cook, put modeling in the middle of the design workplace rather than down in some in some um, basement if you can which we're, we're lucky we can do that in, in the bath office yeah, and I think also it's, it's 
you do quite often get the feedback when you experiment with different materials um, that when we, when we then sort of talk about the model afterwards that that can have a really um, obvious knock on to the design as it's going along, which I think is something we were kind of leaning towards there, Kate. Um, and in terms of the way we choose materials, there is an element of, um, quite often say it's, it's not that dissimilar to if you were redecorating your front room and you kind of picked out a load of different palettes, for example, right, well, we're going to have that colour and that colour and it's going to be set off with that kind of feature wall or whatever it is. And we do quite often take that approach to models. And you're absolutely right in terms of the, the design process of a model. I think touching back to the start when we talk about education, you know, architects learn to design buildings and model makers learn to design models. There is, there is a lot of kind of method and theory behind what we do. It's not as simple as grabbing a couple of bits of material off the shelf and chucking them together mm. and crossing my fingers and hoping for the best. And that, that conversation, that two-way conversation of things not feeling right or things feeling right, it sort of helps you get, get there with the conversation about the wider building and, and, and what's important to you and what's not. It's how you, how you, how you learn from that. Um, uh, and also how by seren you know, serendipity you might surprise yourself and, um, by, by things you didn't plan um, as well. So, um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really important part of the process. I think, and we've got a, we've got a question from Laura mm. Mark, um, which I think does, maybe Laura, would you like to put it forward? Um, hi, yeah, I was just interested in um, what you think about kind of VR and augmented reality and those kind of technologies and what impact they'll have on the kind of need for architectural models in the future. That's a really good question. I hope that um, it augments what we do when we sort of just take all these things as tools uh, uh, and we use them. We use VR. Um, uh, not often putting goggles on, on, on our clients, but we can and then sometimes do. But, uh, but the ability to, to, to um, explicitly show what's going on in, inside of a building is, is really exciting and you should do it. And it helps them get ready for, their, for taking ownership of their building. And so that's great. But I also sort of feel um, it's funny because even though it's, it's super specific and very correct, it still not doesn't prepare you for the finished for the finished uh, building, there, is all, there are always surprises. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, there's, there's an inevitability about, about technology helping us and being there is really about you know, valuable tools um, to, to do what we do. Um, and I think my, my thing it would be, and particularly for making this film actually, is sort of reminding me my thing is, is, is uh, or our, our thing is, just to not let go of the things that are are very useful and are and um, and so um, ideally to be able to, to take along models and and or, you know VR models uh, as well. There is a risk, of course, that the the, the, the with with uh, uh, VR is in, um, you're showing too much too soon quite often. And that takes that's maybe fine amongst yourselves as designers, but there is there it's very it's kind of a difficult thing to know when to time that introduction to a client via VR because they can look incredibly bland and miss sell the product, you know, miss sell the architecture if you're not very careful. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say um, we haven't found the balance, but yeah, I'd say I'd say let it, just for the just for the sake of a, a variety and an interesting working life it's good to have all these things in the, in the mix it also strikes me that they can play different roles too there's things that you can test in vr that you can't necessarily test in a, a scaled model you can actually deal with things at a certain scale and i know that some architects are also working with augmented and virtual reality of actually being able to test distances and operational things mm -hmm. like how actually you work in a hospital how does it work ergonomically a space which is something you can't do a, as easily within a model it has to be a whole scale thing so actually I think that's a they hopefully it enriches I, I think it's moving away from the in both offer different sort of three-dimensional explorations um, one's more material than the other um, and I guess I see practices 
the more one's able to test ideas, um, the better. And it seems to be a quite interesting the more dual it, relationship of the two. Um, and I think yeah. we're talking that that thinking around, you know, what is an appropriate model material to try and convey this also it helps you grapple with what the essence of a project might be. You know, what what should this be made of? Actually helps you understand a project better in some of those decisions. Um, we've got another question yeah. too from Rob, which I really like. Rob, are you there? Do you want to put forward your question? Oh, you're muted. I can't hear you. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to say that I guess sometimes if you're thinking about the, the model as like um, a, a project in itself, um, sometimes the insights as to how you construct the model sort of um, uh, give, give you some idea of um, what some of the like the, the real construction issues are going to be um, when you get to sites. So I just wondered whether you might talk about a time when you got a lot of insight by building the model that, that really informed the construction kind of sequencing or, or the assembly of the actual building. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, um, yeah um, uh, we uh, did a library, um, University of Roehampton Library, um, a brick precast building. And um, uh, um, because it was a precast, um, uh, uh, concrete panels with a brick facing a facade. Uh, one of the one of the ambitions in the project was for it to have a, a great deal of relief in the facade, um, and that's partly around construction tolerances. And um, and we were using um, uh, facade um, uh, uh, laser cut plies, for, you know, um, multiple layers, and thinking about the relief of those to sort of start to to, to Get right into the into the relief modelling uh, of, of the brick and the depth of the reveals and those sorts of things. We also used um, um, 3D modelling actually to test out uh, uh, um, aluminium casting on the same library. Actually, we have had some um, ad, um, uh, natural aluminium, sorry, not natural aluminium because it's anodized aluminium panels. Um, which we were going to emboss or deboss with um, uh, words for library in all the languages um, uh, on Google, actually, but um, um, on Google Translate. But we, um, but but using um, physical relief and to test that out with light, because it it's quite a different thing an embossed or a debossed lettering on those. And then we also started to use that to test out cast. Um, um, at much larger scale, cast aluminium um, uh, relief or a, a freeze design uh, again with layers of, 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 of um, a permeable layer allowing light into a background layer, which you just couldn't really get. You couldn't get. You can't get that on a screen. Um, and so, using one to fives or one to twenties on, on those sorts of details, um, and uh, and again building the frame as well. But, um, uh, of those, of, of both those buildings, but particularly the library, and um, just uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you still go back to the computer, but it's having that having that physical um, presence and understanding of those of those difficult corners of what laps and what abuts and so on, and and, and understanding the um, you know the, the kind of rules within the building, I suppose. I've really often enjoyed witnessing um, the kind of the genius of some model making as well. I mean, I, I worked with um, Heatherwick Studio to try and they were, I had this idea of trying to convey um, an essence of a project, which they kind of had lost to doing, which was the um, UK Pavilion, the Shanghai Expo. And actually, the, you, talk, you talked about it as that sort of experimentate process of experimentation. And I absolutely witnessed it. It was like a project. It was also thinking through how you were going to construct it, the complexity of putting all of those bits together. It was like drawing out a, um, you know, I hadn't ever had, I guess, a chance to see it being thought through, you know, which goes first to make it all come together. And um, I mean, I think there is just complete creative genius that ha takes place in these model making workshops. Um, that is very architectural and it's also something else. Um, and I think that that really came out I mean, it's nice. I think that you know what came out of the film and what you were talking about too is the joy of making, 
um, mm. that, that does come with that. And I think we've probably seen that over the last, you know, this bit of lockdown of people not having access to model making workshops. And actually, I, I wonder how it's, you think it's impacted the studio's work and, you know, not having access to that, but also then the fact that actually people become quite inventive with whatever they have to hand to try and spatialize ideas. And whether you've seen that taking place, what, what you think the future might be having us being kind of away from these great workshops. Hmm. Well, yeah. if, if, sorry, Kirsty, you go. There you go for it, Hugo. Okay. If, if we don't know what's going to happen, but if it's going to carry on, we've got to find a way of, of, uh, of making models and physically engaging with them. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I've got concrete samples and stuff and brick samples turning up at the house at the moment from fabricators up, up north. And, um, we've got to see something in the flesh. So, it, so this is a this is a, a hopefully a, a short term thing until we adapt uh, how to bring that back into the process because the emphasis is on engaging with the physical world and the physicality of things, not on on, on screen. Um, so we know when the, the, we engage with the physical building that. Um, um, we, we, we're already ready for that. We've, we've done the groundwork. So, um, but I think it is interesting that um, one of the key things that um, people seem to be uh, doing as soon as they have uh, more, li you know, limitations on their what they can go and do externally, uh, turning to making and, and repairing and building and doing stuff with their hands. And I'm sure we've all been doing a lot more of that over the last eight weeks. Um, so. Uh, I, I um, uh, don't know quite how we're going to square that circle, but I kind of see us all becoming a bit more of a maker uh, and have contributed to the making process, helping out Cassidy with um, uh, making the work. Yeah, and, definitely. I, I quite like the uh, idea that people, you know, what we were talking about earlier about having more model making on your desk. I know mm. everybody's circumstances are different and, you know, people are working in really unusual environments at the moment, but I love the idea that. You know, we post out a you know a lump of clay and a few basic tools to any all the people, you know, lots of different designers and you know low level or easy to use model making materials. You don't mm. need to have a laser cut and a three D printer and a table saw, whatever it is. You can still experiment with form, especially in really really simple ways from the comfort of your your sofa or your uh, kitchen desk, or whatever it is. So I, I like the idea of that. Um, and I think you're right, there is this sort of almost kind of a bit of a making renaissance going on at the moment where we've all found ourselves in a position where you can't necessarily just go and buy what you need to or um, it's not as easy available. So it's great to see people re-engaging with the making process one way or another. And I think, you know, from a lot of what we've been talking about, there's no question that when people actually engage with making things, you understand them much more than simply designing them, for example. So I hope, I hope we see a knock on from that. That's yeah. right. And also um, there's sort of shades of grey and us starting to get back in and maybe maybe the um, the, the, the consequences of, of the last eight weeks will start making with sort of meeting people more remotely, which is an interesting challenge because it's and that is a challenge because you want to be able to draw on a piece of paper between you and another person but with model making you know um, um i'm sure we we can start to be creative and the advantages of of, of, uh, of printing models or, or or laser cutting them and being able to do repeats and being able to maybe do two or three and send them off to, to people so they're holding the same thing and talking about the same thing or just using good camera technology to be able to film a model in a room and share that and discuss it. You know, I'm sure, um, I'm sure they're, they'll all, you know, it's so interesting how people are being so creative dealing with the, their circumstances. And uh, I'm sure we can bring that back to work and maybe sort of, uh, uh, um, think, think of fun ways of, you know, of, 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 of moving on. Cassidy, one final question. Have you, um, you're talking around that people have become more inventive. Have you rediscovered materials or in this lockdown process been model making in a different way than you have been before? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I've still managed to do a certain amount of model making from home. There was, a, there was a little bit of time before we shut the premises. So I did do sort of fill the car up and drive it all back. And what I've found is um, kind of return to 
or first year architecture students are probably familiar with you know scalpel blades and balsa wood and seeing how far you can get with that and i think i've got a, a renewed appreciation for just how difficult that can be um but equally the the result is very different um you know with a laser cut component you've got burnt edges for example that you can sand off but it's very time consuming um, when you're crafting something or cutting it directly you get again sort of imperfections or you know, a piece of hand slips a little bit and you can gouge a bit out of, you know live with it and kind of that's made this quite nice interesting models so it's a great future i think we're probably getting towards the end we've we promised an hour so we probably should stick to our hour um thank you both for sharing those lovely insights and the kind of the, the world of doing and making and i think it really is important to think you know that thing of thinking through your hands there's something about it and the contemplation it's it is i mean it's akin to sketching people say you know talk about that that process of the the thoughts that go go as you even even laboring as you say with a scalpel and you know it's, it is a, a place of contemplation and quiet thought often um that you really consider each 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 step and there's and i think it's what, it, what what we see and obviously i think it came out in the film but it is always it's a bit that um everybody loves about the summer exhibition but also you know models models intrigue people um, I think they're kind of way for a place of which all of our imaginations go in, mm. you know, the architects, mm. the clients, um, everybody can sort of imagine inhabiting those spaces and what it might mean and the kind of the slippages of the things that where I think the beauty happens in it. So um, thank you for sharing it. And um, yeah, so thank hopefully, you. oh, there is one final question here. Can I even read it? To, it's because it is, it's, I think it's a really, Quite important one, but it's the introducing um, model making to children, interest in design. So, what advice do you have for them to achieve their goals as they're at home, can't use blades and knives um, that architects use for model making? So, what what's safe ways of um, model making at home for kids who want to get inspired? Well, I think just about anything. You know, you can let your imagination run wild. Um, we had a great talk from, um, I've forgotten her name, but a lady a while ago who was doing some essentially master planning and around schools and leisure kind of centres. And she would engage with the kids essentially through cakes and biscuits and sweets, mm. uh, lollipops and all sorts of varying different edible things and lots of colour, lots of texture, for example and uh, they'd be a very loosely defined brief and they would use all of those different materials or edibles to uh, kind of create these really interesting forms and, and it was amazing the way that some of those ideas that you know a bunch of kids cutting up swiss rolls and stacking them up actually did make it all the way through to the final design so i think food's always a good place to start Someone's just been posting some lovely ideas with spaghetti and pva build up yeah. newspaper structures and so on. I like a challenge. We've been doing a challenge with um, trying to get a, um, a ping pong ball from A to B um, and using structures and building structures to sort of try to work out how it can find its way. Um, it's a bit like Mousetrap, that game that we used to, we used to play when we were kids. So, so sort of trying to set yourself a, 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 a task and then, and then uh, whatever you can find around the house. I mean, it's often, I've often, you know, kids can often unlock, you know, they see the opportunity in something, you know, just by looking at what you have around, you know, a piece of paper can suddenly mm. turn into something. And I think that's, you know, quite often we get too worried about the materials or the specificity of it, actually kind of the creation of, of making something and taking whatever's to hand is often where that kind of the magic happens and you see something else. So maybe actually what we need to do is, go into the office with some spaghetti and some other things to yeah. to make right. models so so what everyone's on there what everyone can have on their desks I, can, I do like the idea of the model making reinfesting the office space again and with this idea yeah. if we've got to be socially distanced from one another there's going to be the space there hopefully will be the space then for a lump of clay a bit of something to start making as we said at computers so yeah. thank you for inspiring us all um, to get making and I hope everyone can can look to do it.